Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for our weekly update. I'm very pleased, as always, to be joined by Dr. Lawrence Lowe, our Chief Medical Officer of Health, Sam Rogers, who is Mississauga's Director of Bylaw Enforcement, for any questions you may have about ticketing or enforcement, and for the first time, Mississauga's new Fire Chief and Director of Emergency Management, Darren Rizzi. We're very excited to have Chief Rizzi at the helm of Mississauga FES. Chief Rizzi brings two decades of experience with her to the city. She first started out as a firefighter in Vaughan, then worked her way up to Deputy Chief and then to Fire Chief. Chief Rizzi has also spent time working at the Provincial Emergency Operations Centre, where she provided leadership and guidance on operations, education and emergency training. We're truly lucky to have her here at the helm in Mississauga, and I look forward to working closely with her in the years to come. I'd like to invite Chief Rizzi up to say a few words. Chief? It's an honor to join the Mississauga Fire and Emergency Services team in the role of Fire Chief. Mississauga Fire and Emergency Services is a proactive leader in the delivery of fire protection, prevention, and emergency services, and we strive to meet the current and evolving diverse needs of our city. Our highly trained and skilled professionals demonstrate an unwavering commitment to fire and life safety, and I'm proud to serve alongside the 750 uniformed men and women. In my new role as Fire Chief and Director of Emergency Management, I'm joining an organization that has taken decisive, evidence-driven measures to try and stop the spread of COVID-19 and protect the health and wellness of its residents and businesses. I have already received several briefings from the Office of Emergency Management and the COVID-19 Policy Group about the unique challenges this pandemic has presented here in Mississauga. These teams have been working diligently for over a year now and will continue to do so in this dynamic, ever-changing situation. In addition to entering this new role, I'm joining a community that has demonstrated an incredible determination and resilience over the past year. I know this has been and continues to be a challenging time for the people of Mississauga. However, the actions we take today, tomorrow, and in the coming weeks and months will help stop the spread of COVID-19 and will continue to save lives. We have begun to see positive evidence that the efforts of the people of Mississauga are working as case counts decrease. This does not mean the fight is over and the situation could change quickly, especially as new variants are being reported throughout the province and right here in Mississauga but there is light at the end of the tunnel. As your new fire chief and emergency management director, I'm asking the people of Mississauga to please continue to follow all public health guidelines to stop the spread of COVID-19. I know it's not easy, but soon, as more people begin to receive their vaccinations, you will be able to look back and be proud of the actions we all took to save lives. Pride and honour. Thank you very much, Chief. COVID-19 cases in the region of Peel and in Mississauga are steadily declining, which is extremely encouraging news. Peel is now averaging 146 cases per 100,000, and that's down from 183 cases per 100,000 last week. Mississauga is averaging 119 cases per 100,000, and that is down from 145 just a week ago. We are beginning to see the situation in our hospitals improve as well. Trillium Health Partners is currently dealing with 54 COVID patients, 10 in the ICU, and 61 suspected COVID uh, cases. Brampton's William Osler Hospital has 69 COVID patients, 11 in the ICU, and 53 suspected cases. 
In Peel, there are currently 21 long-term care homes, 10 retirement homes, and 14 group homes or assisted living facilities in active outbreak. All across the board, the numbers are moving in the right direction. And that shows our collective efforts are paying off. It shows that the vast majority of residents in Mississauga are playing their part by listening to the advice of public health. And I want to thank everyone for continuing to make huge sacrifices to help us get this virus under control. But even with our numbers going down, we cannot afford to get complacent. The reality is that Ontario is now dealing with new, more transmissible variants that have the potential to undo all the hard work we've done at reducing our case counts. Like many of you, I was extremely concerned to learn that a Mississauga resident tested positive for B.1.351, better known as the South African variant. What's particularly troubling is that this individual has not traveled, meaning that it was acquired within the community. Peel Public Health has also confirmed six cases of B.1.7, also known as the UK variant. Dr. Lowe has told me that we cannot, um, excuse me, we can only expect the number of variant cases to increase. And that is why right now we have to continue to be vigilant and follow the same advice as we have been over the past few months. And that, of course, is staying home and leaving only for essential trips and, of course, exercise. I was very encouraged last week, both the Federal Government of Canada and the Government of Ontario move forward with enhanced travel measures, including new mandatory testing for international travellers arriving back in Canada. This is something that I've been calling for, along with all the other mayors right across the province. And I want to thank Premier Ford in particular for ensuring mandatory testing got underway immediately at Pearson Airport. I believe that this is an important layer of community protection as we deal with the threat of new variants from outside the country. As much as we need to stay the course for now, we also need to begin thinking about what a safe reopening looks like. On my weekly call with the other GTHA mayors and chairs, we all supported the submissions by our medical officers of health to the province about the importance of the safe reopening of schools as soon as possible. Health experts agree that in-class learning is so critical for the well-being of students with the proper pro protocols in place to keep both students and our educators safe. We're also calling on the Government of Canada and Ontario in consultation with municipalities to prepare plans for a broader re and safe reopening. I really do believe that if we all hang in there for just a few more weeks, our case numbers will get low enough to see the reopening of many of our small businesses. This is so important as so many of our small business owners continue to struggle from the impacts of the extended lockdown. I am, however, frustrated that I'm up here once again with no update on paid sick leave. I've talked to the ministers in both the provincial and the federal cabinets and will continue to do so, asking that they work together to put this important measure into place. I really believe that the two levels of government can come together to figure this out. Workplaces continue to be the main driver of this virus and, as we have seen with Dr. Lowe's report, workers are going into work sick because they don't have access to paid sick leave. This isn't just happening in Peel, it's happening right across the province. These men and women working in factories, food processing facilities, warehouses, and of course grocery stores, who continue to provide the rest of us with the essential items that we need. These are the staff in our long-term care homes who are taking huge personal risks to care for our seniors. These are the low-income workers who cannot afford to miss a paycheck. And the reality is that many are women, and many come from racialized communities, groups that already face significant barriers. 
We need to get this right for them. I wrote an op-ed last week in the Toronto Star along with Mayor Patrick Brown from Brampton detailing why the Canada Recovery Sickness Benefit simply does not provide the adequate supports that they need. Doctors and other health experts have been calling on this for months. We always say that we must listen to our health experts. So why exactly have we ignored their advice on paid sick leave? Please, let's get this right. I will continue to advocate for this. I simply won't slow down. It's going to be months until all Ontarians are vaccinated and paid sick leave is one of the best tools we have to limit the spread of COVID-19. It's an investment that can save lives and allow us to begin the economic recovery we know we all need. I want to talk quickly about our isolation centres. I'm really grateful that the governments of Ontario and of Canada have helped Peel set up isolation centres right across the region. We now have four of them up and running in Peel. Anyone who tests positive for COVID-19 can safely quarantine there. And I strongly encourage you to do so. If you do not have adequate space to quarantine or are at risk of spreading it to others in your home, you need a safe place to isolate. And I encourage you to call 905-281-1269. Again, that's 905 905- 281-1269. And before I ask Dr. Lowe to come up, I'd like to acknowledge that it's February, which means that it's Black History Month. It's an important opportunity to celebrate and explore the rich culture, heritage, and history of Black Mississaugans and Black Canadians. In Mississauga, we celebrate the things that make us different, while at the same time we embrace our shared values that are deeply rooted in the identity of our city. Diversity makes Mississauga shine. And on February 23rd, I will be hosting a Black History Month event that celebrates Mississauga's black trailblazers, organizations, and businesses who have helped lift up the community during the pandemic. Stay tuned for more information on this on my social media. Over the last year, we saw our racialized communities continue to fight for justice as the Black Lives Matter movement swept our nation and put a spotlight on the injustices many of our friends and our neighbours experience. While we have taken positive and progressive steps forward, there is more work we need to do as a city and a community to tackle racism and discrimination, and in particular, anti-Black racism and discrimination. It will take all of us working together, community and religious leaders, elected officials and beyond, to ensure everyone can continue to grow and to thrive in our city. At the City of Mississauga, we've taken steps to ensure our workplace is inclusive and responsive to the BIPOC community and that our institutions work hard to be equitable and without discrimination for the people that we serve. In June, Council passed Motion 207 to address anti-black and anti-indigenous racism, which has been identified as an historic, pervasive, institutional and systemic issue in Mississauga. Part of these recommendations included establishing a black caucus who, through their own lived experiences, is advising me and giving feedback on initiatives pertaining to the black community in addressing racism, discrimination and systemic changes in Mississauga. I'm also working with our city manager on how we apply this important work to city programs and to our hiring practices. We're already reviewing internal policies and programs to ensure that we are free from racial bias and not negatively impacted, impacting racialized groups. And we're engaging our black employees in a series of conversations on anti-black racism to understand their experiences in the workplace and build a plan to address systemic inequities. I am fully committed to doing my part to ending systemic racism in all its forms. And I will use all my power at the city to ensure that we, we aren't just known as one of the most diverse cities in the country, 
but also one of the most welcoming and inclusive. And now, I'd like to invite Dr. Lawrence Lowe to pre please provide his update. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and good afternoon. This week, Mississauga's test positivity for COVID-19 currently sits at 7%, which is down from 7.9% last week, and the weekly incidence rate sits at 119 new cases per 100,000, down from 145 per 100,000 last week. I am hopeful that this decline is the start of a more defined trend in bringing the second wave under control in our community and an expected stabilization in our hospital capacity to follow. I know the sacrifice it has taken, especially for what seems like a never-ending emergency and for the businesses impacted, for all who have sacrificed time in person, know that all your sacrifices have saved lives. Thank you. Now, as we approach the 28-day review of the provincial stay-at-home order next week, we are now in a clear race between variants and vaccines. The recent detection of rapidly spreading variants in our community underscores the importance of continued vigilance. The spread of these more transmissible variants could very easily reverse the gains we have started to see, putting lives and again our hospital system in jeopardy. We must continue for the moment to stay at home as much as possible, working and meeting virtually, and where we must meet in person, distancing, masking, and limiting the duration of contact with anyone from outside of our immediate home all remain fundamental to limiting spread. More than ever, it is also crucial for us to protect the essential workers who continue to show up for work in person every day. They need inspections, investigations, and protections. Through numerous conversations with our Ministry of Labour partners, I have learned that the nature of regulations in place actually may limit inspector access and more frequent proactive workplace inspections. I call on this to be reviewed and resolved to ensure that our data on workplace outbreaks and high-risk sectors can be acted on. I also call for additional resources to be given to our Ministry of Labour partners to ensure that workers and our community can be protected. We also continue to request more rapid testing to be deployed in high-risk workplaces, especially those in outbreaks. And as Mayor Comby has very uh, dedicatedly ad advocated for, paid sick days continue to remain an essential part of the equation. We have received funding to open voluntary isolation housing, but the people that need it can't take time off work to go there. Testing in our community, the capacity continues to improve and increase, but some workers decline to even get tested, fearful that they would have to take time off work and isolate while waiting for a result, and that a positive result would keep them from a paycheck. Our own data at Peel Public Health showed that 25% of the cases in our region went to work while they were symptomatic. How will we keep these aggressive new variants at bay if our frontline workers cannot afford to take time off work to stop the spread? How are we going to keep things down until the vaccines arrive in earnest? Regarding vaccines, I am grateful for your continued patience. I know many residents want the vaccine, as soon as possible. We continue to vaccine, vaccinate priority groups as designated by the province and will continue to do so quickly once more vaccine arrives because focusing on the most vulnerable among us is the right and ethical thing to do. I ask that in the meantime, everyone stay safe and remain vigilant until vaccine availability improves. Our time will come and although it may not be for a few months, just know that you are not being forgotten. We want everyone who can be vaccinated, who wants to be vaccinated, to get the shot. And once we have the supply, Peel Public Health, our hospital partners, and the rest of the healthcare system is going to work tirelessly to make that happen. 
Truly, the end of this can't come soon enough for everyone, myself included, but we can't take our eyes off the prize just yet. What happens next is in our hands, in how we stay apart, and how we help others to do the same. Thank you, and I'll pass it back to Mayor Crombie. Thank you, Dr. Lowe, and that is the end of the formal remarks, and we are all happy to take questions from the media. Thank you. Your first question comes from Stephanie Moroda at the Globe and Mail. Go ahead, Stephanie. Welcome, Stephanie. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much. So I'll throw this question to both you, Mayor Crombie, and Dr. Lowe. Certainly. And it's on the Canada, so it's on the Canada Post outbreak, and it's been a month since that outbreak started, and since then cases grew to be one of the biggest workplace outbreaks in the province. And Peel and Canada Post launched one of the largest mass testing initiatives done so far at a workplace. So from the investigation that's been done, what do we know about what caused the virus to spread so widely and what measures were the most effective in getting the outbreak under control? So Stephanie, from what I know, I believe there are 275 approximately workers now in isolation or quarantining at home. And of course, there was unfortunately one death. And I'm very sorry to and pass my condolences once again to that individual's family. And I know that rapid testing is in place. I think it's the perfect environment that rapid testing be used to test all shifts as they come into work. And I'll pass it over to Dr. Lowe, who can respond to what other measures have been in place and what could have been done differently, because I think it's uh, very very good advice and a great question, Stephanie. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Madam Mayor. Thanks, Stephanie, for the question. Uh, certainly, uh, the uh, extent of the outbreak at Canada Post, uh, um, despite that, d despite the extent of the outbreak at Canada Post, uh, it did respond to the uh, typical measures that we would usually employ in an outbreak of this nature in a workplace. Uh, initial uh, initial measures taken around infection prevention and control audits, uh, isolation and uh, of close contacts identified through case management and contact tracing, and then when identifying uh, in the course of our exposure assessments other uh, potential chains of transmission beyond the initial chains that were identified further plant closures, et cetera, uh, which led to the initial request for rapid testing on the part of the province. So, uh, you know, it, it really is the same, uh, you know, graduated principle uh, in terms of how, um, how that workplace uh, was uh, undertaken. Uh, it does speak to the very insidious nature of this disease uh, that even with, uh, you know, certain precautions in place, uh, there are lapses that occur, uh, you know, precautions are not fail safe. Uh, and uh, certainly with levels of transmission, as we were seeing, uh, you know, at at the height of uh, what appears to be the height, hopefully, of the second wave in our community, uh, you know, it was able to uh, obtain a foothold and, and spread. However, you know, the measures were taken quickly, uh, rapidly, and uh, we were uh, grateful uh, for, the for the collaboration of the workplace in question uh, to make sure that uh, the spread was eventually contained. Thanks for the question. Follow up? Hi, yes, my, my follow-up question is for Dr. Lowe. Sure, go ahead, Stephanie. So you mentioned in your remarks that the ministry has flagged barriers to investigations. So could you elaborate on this a little bit more? What are the barriers? What effect does this have on outbreaks? And, and what exactly are you calling on the province to do to lift those barriers? Thanks for the question, Stephanie. So as I understand it, I mean, aside from resourcing, which is a challenge certainly for the number of workplaces uh, and the number of inspectors that our Ministry of Labour partners are able to engage, uh, my understanding is that regulations uh, limit um, limit proactive pieces to uh, identified priorities on the part of the ministry. And there are, as you can imagine, uh, lots of priority sectors uh, that are uh, being slated for proactive inspections. Um, and then also, I, you know, I understand that there are uh, elements of the regulation uh, that limit the nature of entry uh, to certain workplaces, which I think the Ministry of Labour would be best to speak to. Uh, you know, I've just, uh, I, for me, my understanding is that there are those limitations under the regulation. And so I'm essentially calling for, you know, essentially what we have here in Peel Public Health was we have published, uh, we're one of the first health units in the province uh, to start publishing uh, sector information by where we are seeing workplace outbreaks, uh, which is far more useful than naming a single outbreak, uh, by the way, in a workplace that actually names specific sectors where there may be challenges uh, and problems with their processes. Um, my goal and desire is to see that data acted on in terms of prioritizing proactive uh, inspections and to make sure that proactive inspections can happen regularly, frequently, uh, and uh, certainly in a manner that will ensure that workers are kept safe. Thanks very much for the question. Thank you. Next question. 
Your next question comes from Steve Cornwell at the Mississauga News. Go ahead, Steve. Welcome, Mayor Steve. Tommy, how are you? I'm well, Steve. Thank you. How about you? I hope you're well, too. I'm uh, doing well. Good. Um, there was some talk today on uh, at uh, Mississauga Council about uh, some vaccination sites uh, in the city, you know, vaccine um, being available. So just curious, maybe for you and Dr. Lowe, what um, the process has been for kind of citing the potential locations and um, basically what the, what the reception has been from residents, if there has, has been any consultations on it. Sure, I'll let him respond, but I, I'm aware that um, we have been working very closely with the region of Peel, and we have been looking at our, our, some of our arenas, some of our community centers, to see what would be the best uh, and most centralized locations. And certainly, we've uh, they've now turned their attention to the international center closer to the airport, uh, as well as some of the community centers. They're looking at River Grove and possibly even Carmen Corbison. Um, and then there was, as you recall, some discussion about uh, registration for those and we hope that those will registration will be allowed locally so that we can give our seniors uh, who are living independently first access to their vaccination. Dr. Lowe, why don't you respond as well? Thank you. Yes, uh, thanks Steve for the question. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Certainly, at least on the last point that uh, Mayor Crombie was speaking to, uh, the province is developing a scheduling system and uh, obviously scheduling will, as I understand it, uh, be uh, undertaken at a local level and uh, you know, certainly uh, within the priority groups that are identified uh, throughout the vaccine allocation. Uh, in terms of how sites are uh, located, we are certainly um, uh, looking at a number of factors, uh, you know, certainly a site that's big enough to accommodate uh, a large enough volume of individuals, to accommodate uh, precautions such as uh, physical distancing, masking, physical barriers that may be there uh, to reduce risk of transmission, uh, also sites that have lots of parking, also possibly transit access, uh, and also considering sites that are uh, distributed throughout the community, uh, throughout all three municipalities, um, and also maybe uh, located ne near or close to high priority areas. I, I think it's also important to note that besides looking at fixed community sites, we are also looking at other modalities including uh, on-site uh, clinics, which is what we've been using for for long-term care and high-risk retirement homes, those may be deployed to things like big workplaces or, uh, you know, other venues uh, within the community. Um, and certainly um, drive-through um, as well as mobile options, these are all uh, things that are uh, currently being finalized at this point in time uh, with an understanding that while we don't have the supply right now, uh, we at least in Peel Public Health, uh, together with our partners, are going to be absolutely ready once we have an understanding and a, and a line of sight into when those vaccines are coming. So, uh, you know, there are a lot of factors factors that go into the decision so far. Mayor Crombie has identified some of the sites that have met our criteria that we're continuing to work on. Uh, those are just a starting point. There will be more sites and there will be more announcements uh, announced once the details are ironed out and finalized. Thanks very much for the question. My follow-up is actually for you, Dr. Lowe, as well. All right, thanks. Go ahead, Steve. Um, you mentioned uh, in the earlier press conference today with, uh, with Mayor Brown in Brampton that um, uh, you're thinking about the next priority uh, could potentially be getting uh, children back in school. Um, I'm just thinking about earlier in the pandemic um, when the province had opened uh, things up a little bit more, you you talked about the importance of balancing exposure. So I'm just wondering if uh, if the next move is to, um, at some point with conditions, I'm assuming, to, to allow kids back in school in uh, Peel, um, can you kind of tell us about what a balance might be to limit exposures if that is what uh, the next steps are? So, Steve, it's a great question. So, at the time when I was proposing a balance in terms of limiting contacts, uh, we were in a situation where we were seeing an ascendancy of the virus. Uh, there was definitely uh, the potential for exponential growth, and a second wave had just started. We are now no longer in that situation. Uh, as you know, uh, we are seeing over the last two weeks uh, the start of a downward trend. However, with the arrivals of variants in the community, we must proceed cautiously. We must move cautiously. And so that is why at my press conference this morning with Mayor Brown, I made very clear that if I had to reopen one thing, because there is only one thing that I would consider potentially supporting reopening at this point in time in our community, 
it would be schools. And simply because we do know uh, that at the levels that we are seeing currently, uh, it was similar to November, we were able to uh, keep, on, uh, keep on top of case and contact management uh, within schools, uh, dismissals, uh, you know, keeping students safe, the measures in, in place and that were taken by our frontline teachers really made schools a very safe place, uh, you know, just on the basis of our analyses, uh, you know, uh, in, in terms of our contact tracing. So we're at a level again now, similar to where November was, where we know that uh, there is capacity to respond to cases that may be showing up in schools. Um, and we also know that on a cost benefit, it is better for children to be in classroom rather than virtual, uh, aside from the eye strain and the difficulty of uh, screen time, uh, you know, certainly in terms of uh, sitting in front of a monitor all day long. Uh, we know that for their learning, their socialization, uh, their development, uh, there are significant benefits to having children back in the classroom that potentially outweigh any potential uh, lingering risk uh, as we continue the downward transmission. So, uh, you know, I think the short answer is uh, if there is one thing that is going to open now as we're seeing the decreasing trend, it would be school and everything else, uh, you know, we want to get those kids back into school and make sure that they stay in school so the rest of it will have to follow gradually. So it's different from the balance previously where we were trying to keep some measure of control in place to forestall an, a surge. We're now seeing a decreasing trend that now the question is what's the order to start um, reopening with confidence. Thanks for the question, Steve. Next question, please. Your next question comes from Ashley Newport at Ansaga. Go ahead, Ashley. Hi, Mayor Crombie. Hi, Ashley. Nice to hear from you. Welcome back. Thank you. Um, so I was going to also ask a question about something that came up at a council earlier today. Uh, I know during the meeting it came up that the province has yet to respond uh, to the city's inquiries about um, whether or not dog groomers and walkers can, yeah, pet, uh, pet services can, mm -hmm. can remain open. So that actually, um, I'm wondering if the province has responded to um, also an earlier motion from council about considering cracking down more on big box and then considering uh, gradually opening uh, smaller business, probably retail. Have you heard from the province about that at all or any response on, on that file? Um, so, <laughs> so let's t take one at a time. Certainly with, with respect to the big box, uh, there was, um, uh, I, we heard from the premier that there uh, would be it would cause supply chain issues should we close down the non-essential aisle and uh, I'm happy to report that even Dr. Lowe called on the province to um, ask uh, those large retailers not to sell those uh, or Amazon for that matter those uh, non-essential items so that was uh, we were in concert together there but unfortunately there has been no move to do so uh, so I, I guess there is a reluctance on the part Part of the province to do so and affect uh, in their minds the supply chain issues what could result. Um, on the dog grooming, the pet grooming, dog walking, uh, uh, dog grooming. We very much see it uh, as benefiting the health and the welfare uh, of our little furry f family members. Um, and we all know that certain pets won't respond to um, the pet owner, but that, that are, you know, but welcome uh, the, the groomer instead. So we saw it as, as a health and safety issue with respect to the animals, and we are awaiting further clarification on on that issue, as well as the City of Toronto, City of Toronto and uh, Miss City of Mississauga have taken the same approach that uh, we will cease uh, the enforcement until um, until we get further clarification. I don't know one of our bylaw enforcement wants to comment or... Sure, Sam Rogers would like to comment on this as well. Ashley, all right, I'm just gonna bring Sam up. And then we'll have Dr. Lowe comment to the first issue on the uh, big box. Thank you, Mayor Crombie, for the opportunity to just comment a little bit more on the uh, on the dog grooming issue. It's uh, it's one that's continued to be uh, quite frankly confusing for our residents and businesses. Uh, going back before the new lockdown measures came into effect in December 26, and we've taken all of that into context and consideration prior to making the decision to suspend enforcement uh, until we receive clarity from the province on the matter. And the mayor's letter is very clear on that. Uh, I would like to just point out, uh, suspension does not suggest that we are permitting or going against the regulations that are or the law itself. 
itself. That's not our authority. Uh, however, the matter's not clear, uh, and we've made the decision along with other enforcement agencies within the GTA, we all kind of agree, um, because of the, you know, changes to the regs before the lockdown and the existing regulations now, we need more clarification and to ensure the health and safety of, uh, of animals, as Mayor Crombie's already alluded to. Thanks for the opportunity. And sorry, Ashley, could you remind me, because I've just, my mind's in, oh. Uh, so I, I believe it's about uh, my calls, uh, at least around uh, revisiting non-essential items online. Um, and uh, certainly in, in general, just uh, the definition of essential and non-essential. Um, I think the first thing I'll state at the outset is, uh, you know, paid sick days is a great way to make sure that we can keep businesses open uh, and keep workers safe. Um, but uh, to the, uh, in the, uh, advice that I'd given around non-essential items, I wanted to make very clear that this was meant to be a temporary uh, measure uh, on the part of individuals to really look at what you're buying uh, online and to really think about does this need to be bought right now, just this instance, uh, in the next, say, two to four weeks? Especially as we're still seeing transmission within our, uh, you know, our essential workers, uh, the Canada Post uh, outbreak that we were talking about just recently, a great example of that. Uh, every package that ends up on your front doorstep, ultimately someone had to put it there. Right, And we do know that if volumes are significant, uh, there are sometimes corners that might get cut or lapses might happen, and that's where transmission may be occurring. Uh, so in the absence of paid sick days, I think the recommendation was just more, you know, uh, looking out for our more vulnerable workers and thinking, do you really need X, Y, or Z uh, just for the moment, uh, or can it wait uh, just two to four weeks while uh, transmission levels come down in our community? Uh, it's by no means meant to single out businesses. We recognize that it has been a difficult time. It's, uh, a lot of people have sacrificed. And I do know that this is a time where, you know, add to cart can be quite therapeutic uh, for a lot of people as well. I, I understand that. Um, but it was meant to really raise uh, awareness of the fact that every package that does end up on one's doorstep, uh, you know, essential or otherwise, uh, is actually put there by uh, one of our workers. And they are ultimately assuming that risk of potential exposure and transmission on the behalf of all of us who have the opportunity to essentially stay at home. That's essentially where that recommendation came from. Thanks very much. Next question. Follow up. Follow up. Yep. Thank you, oh. Ashley. Yep. Thank you. Actually, sorry, my follow up is actually for Dr. Lowe. Okay, here we go. Sorry about that, Ashley. Please go ahead. I should have said so sooner. Uh, my question is also about uh, school reopenings. I know you said that um, if something should reopen first, it should definitely be school. So with the potential for schools to open within the next maybe two weeks or something, depending on what the province says, um, what ways do you think would be good for schools to try to make sure that transmission is as low as possible? Like, are you considering rapid testing, um, potentially rolling out rapid testing at schools, or what other things are you considering that schools might be able to do that might keep numbers lower? Thanks so much for the question, Ashley. So certainly it would be a reversion to all of the measures that were put in place before uh, the winter break started. Um, but also, uh, at least in Peel, we had a, you know, a number of unique pieces. So for example, we went to si a single symptom screening, uh, you know, uh, to make sure that people who had one symptom, uh, you know, would not necessarily, we would probably take that similar conservative approach to keep uh, uh, symptomatic individuals out of the, uh, out of the school system. Uh, rapid testing, uh, absolutely. And I understand that that is something that is now being offered by provincial partners. Uh, this does not mean rapid testing every student all the time, uh, but it means deploying it particularly in high-risk neighborhoods where there might be a school and outbreak. Uh, it allow us to essentially circumscribe the nature of the outbreak uh, more quickly uh, through rapid testing in the same way that we're hoping to do the same with workplaces. Uh, it's certainly more active screening of students, uh, making sure that there's uh, uh, you know additional support, personal protective equipment and guidance uh, uh, for staff and teachers, etc. So there are a number of measures uh, that uh, we have uh, continued to work with our school board partners on and continue in conversation with our provincial partners on uh, to really make sure uh, that we can continue to uh, make sure uh, to continue to reopen schools and keep our, our children uh, in schools uh, you know through the rest of um, the school year so thanks very much for the question next question your next question comes from Viosa SI at the pointer go ahead Viosa Hi, Mayor Crombie. I hope you're well. Both my questions are actually for Dr. Lowe. Okay, Fiosa, thank you. No problem. <laughs> let, me, let, him, let me get him up here. Thank you. Sorry, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Fiosa. Go ahead. 
Um, so, hi, Dr. Lowe. Um, as you know, active screening protocols came into place yesterday at the Gateway Coastal Facility. Mm -hmm. um, a notice at the facility says that the change was initiated by a directive from Peel Public Health. So I'm just wondering if you can speak to how public health can proactively put similar directives in place in industrial settings that are deemed to be a high risk or if there's an infection spread that has to meet some kind of threshold before public health can intervene. Viosa, public health has long recommended that active screening be undertaken for all workplaces that remain open. So, it, so it's a directive now because it wasn't uh, clearly in, in that situation, but it has always been our recommendation that active screening be, can, be, uh, be uh, implemented in workplaces that are, uh, that are remaining open. Uh, the Region of Peel, for example, does conduct active screening as well. So the answer is that's our recommendation. Understood. Um, and so, um, and next follow up. Um, last week, Dr. Steiny Brown of the Ontario Science Table said that new variants of concern will likely be the dominant strain by March, and research is showing that it's more, they're more transmissible. Um, I'm wondering, with these variants in the community, if Peel reopens small business before reaching zero positive cases, are you concerned there'll be a repeat of what we saw in the second wave? Yeah, I, like I said, I think the the concern, as I mentioned in my remarks uh, today, uh, we're now in a race between the variants and the vaccines. And uh, whatever we do next, uh, we have to remember the uh, cases that have been detected, both uh, of B1.1.7 as well as B1.351 uh, uh, in our community, were both acquired in the community, have been acquired in the community, not both, because there's seven of them all together. But all of, all of our cases have been acquired in the community in some form. Some of them have had travel histories, but there are community acquisitions that are occurring, which means that if we don't, uh, if we open too quickly, uh, we really do risk, uh, you know, um, removing all the gains that we've had, all the sacrifices that I've made over the next two months. Now, I know that's not what small business wants to hear, and I will, uh, you know, strongly advocate for uh, small businesses who continue to be impacted by this to get every and all supports uh, that can be given to them uh, to make sure that they are able to weather the storm. But it really is a matter of trying to keep transmission and the variants down so that eventually when the vaccine starts to arrive, we can actually really start to change the, uh, the tail of the tape on this one. Thanks very much. Viosa, was your next question for Dr. Lowe as well? Oh, that, was she actually had, that was it, okay. She had two. Great, thank you. Your final question comes from Khaled Salama at My Second Home TV. Well, uh, go ahead, Khaled. Welcome, Khaled. Thank you. Uh, how are you, Madam Mayor? I'm so well. I hope you are too. I'm trying to keep up. Thank you so much for asking. Um, just before I ask my uh, two questions, uh, can I ask for additional question for Chef Rezi as well? Oh, I'm sure she would like that. That's great. She's nodding. No problem. You're the last uh, questioner, so we'll allow that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Keep it for me always. Um, did you get any guidelines? or extra information about the mandatory uh, hotel uh, and 2000 quarantine period from the feds? Um, so the, I'll let Dr. Lowe respond to that, Khalid, but no, we have not at the city. I understand that is a federal responsibility um, and whatever the protocols will be used for those quarantine hotels for travelers coming through Toronto Pearson Airport, Dr. Lowe. He's nodding that he'll respond as well, Khalid. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, thanks so much for the question, Khalid. Uh, you know, we, I would recommend that you ask our federal counterparts at the Public Health Agency of Canada. Uh, I understand that the protocols are still uh, being developed uh, for us in local public health. We certainly want to learn a bit more because uh, many of these hotels and individuals will be housed in our jurisdiction, so it will be important for us to know uh, how they will be um, making sure that quarantine is enforced and, mean, you know, certainly a contact between returning travelers and staff who, many of staff who may be residents of our region. So we're also keen to uh, hear what the protocols are going to be, uh, but at this point in time we have no further insight as a local public health unit and ultimately uh, entry into the country as federal jurisdiction. Thanks for the question. Thank you so much. Can you, can you please stay here, uh, Dr. Lou? Sorry. Uh, yes, Cal, no go problem. ahead. No problem. Uh, um, we heard from Prime Minister about the Novavax uh, vaccine and he uh, had chosen some of the facilities in Montreal to uh, be the production facilities. Uh, why do you think he did this choice or had this choice Although we have lots of qualified facilities here in uh, 
so thanks, Khaled. I mean, I, I wouldn't presume to speculate as to why the federal government chose uh, one site over the other. Um, having worked in vaccine safety, I know Montreal has uh, a significant biotechnology uh, industry, but we do here in our backyard here in, in Mississauga as well. So, I, I mean, I, I think there are probably um, other factors at play uh, that uh, I would recommend you, uh, you know, it would probably be best directed to the um, Prime Minister's office and Cabinet as to why that decision was taken. Uh, in general, as a public health physician and one who is quite weary of this pandemic, uh, I'm just grateful that at least that capability has been uh, identified and will hopefully be brought online in short order. Thanks for the question. Thank you so much, Dr. Lu. Chief Rizzi? Good afternoon. So welcome to Mississauga. Good afternoon. Welcome to Mississauga and congratulations, Thank Chief Rizzi. Um, uh, when uh, uh, I read the announcement of your appointment, I was really thrilled with your extensive resume and skills and experience. And um, I believe that you are you have everything it needs. So my question is, with your background and academia and technical. What do you think we still lag here in Mississauga when it comes to uh, fighting fire in uh, uh, our uh, modern days? Thank you for the question. So there are three critical aspects of fire and life safety. The first is fire prevention, so changing people's fire safe behaviors. And that could be in the homes, it could be in the businesses. When we're unsuccessful through our public education of changing behavior, then we have to go to a little bit more of an aggressive stance, which is enforcement. So those are fire code orders. And that's to help change the behavior because our public education hasn't done that. And then the last is our response. And a response obviously takes a lot of personnel and a lot of resources. And obviously today is my day two. So in terms of taking a look at the overall organization and, and the critical services we provide to the public, that assessment is ongoing. But certainly those are the three areas that I will continue to focus on is our public education and public outreach. So getting into the community and working with our community groups and our community leaders. The second is uh, enforcement efforts and certainly taking a look at response times and ensuring that when our firefighters are needed in an emergency situation, they're there in a timely manner. So those are the three key aspects I will be looking at as fire chief. That concludes our press conference for today. Uh, thank everyone for joining and uh, we'll be back next week. Thank you. <laughs>